Hi everyone, today I will be talking about thermal physics, uh, the first two chapter, sub-chapters of thermal physics. Um, this is a topic that looks at temperature and matter, so in a microscopic um, scale of how they work at atomic level basically, and how that will lead on to later on, will affect the pressure, temperature and so on. Um, so the first thing that we're going to have a look at is uh, 5.1.1 temperature. Uh, you will need to be very well, very well uh, aware and define and be able to define thermal equilibrium and apply it. What we mean by absolute scale of temperature, um, how to make convert measurements from um, Kelvin and Celsius, and how they kind of got the scale of both uh, temperature measurements in um, Celsius and Kelvin. So to start with, I'm going to go to thermal equilibrium. So what thermal equilibrium basically states is that when you have two objects that are in thermal equilibrium, there will be no net flow of thermal energy um, between them. Now thermal energy, remember, you've learned it in your GCSEs, um, is a form of energy store and that is based on the temperature of um, partly on the temperature of a body um, so what do we mean by that in terms of temperature that we will both eventually reach the same temperature um, you have experienced this in real life as well yourself so if you go outside and it's really cold your body um, starts um, giving out um, thermal energy to the surroundings and your body temperature kind of drops, um, not, not internally too much, but on the surface at least your body starts feeling colder. Um, we also have this law in thermodynamics, uh, which is called the zeroth law of thermodynamics. It's called the zeroth law because they, they decided after the first three laws to add this because it's so fundamental to the whole idea of thermodynamics and, and, and in general in physics. Um, it just states that if two objects are in thermal equilibrium with a third, then all three are in thermal equilibrium with each other. So if I had um, four bodies, so body A, body B, body C, could be any object, could be three beakers or uh, three blocks that are at different temperatures. Um, so for example, if at the beginning, the start, the temperature of A was 100 degrees Celsius, the temperature of B was 20 degrees Celsius, and the temperature of C is 0 degrees Celsius, there will be a net flow of thermal energy between them, but eventually, uh, so from hotter to colder is always the way, so uh, thermal energy always transfers from hot to cold objects, never the other way around, uh, because obviously hotter objects are usually have more uh, thermal energy than, hot, than colder objects. But we will see this in more detail later on in the chapters, uh, especially chapter 14 and 15, um, will kind of change the way that you view temperature and thermal energy. Now, um, the zero law, is basically um, what we mean by um, how they're all going to be in thermal equilibrium. So what it states is that all objects will reach the same temperature um, eventually. So A, B and C will eventually reach the same exact temperature, depending on what materials they are. And um, if they're isolated, obviously, from uh, any external uh, temperature changes, they will all be at the same temperature. So what we will have is energy transferring from A to B and from B to C uh, until they all reach the same temperature. So thermal equilibrium is when there is no net flow or overall, no overall flow of thermal energy between them. Net stands for overall. Um, then we go... So here we covered the first part, thermal equilibrium. 
then we have the absolute uh, scale of temperature or what we call the thermodynamic scale of temperature and it does not depend on any property of any particular substance. So I'll go through that in uh, detail. Um, first, I will talk about measuring the temperature. So that was the third point, the third learning objective. Now in GCSEs, you have learned that temperature is a measurement of how hot or cold something is. So it's quite straightforward when you think about it in this way. So temperature is how hot or cold something is. It actually represents the average kinetic energy of the particles within a substance or an object. But we will look at that in more detail, like I said, later on in the chapters, the first two, um, A2 chapters. Now, when every time we do need to be able to make a measurement of something, uh, even the Celsius um, uh, scale, for example, we need to have two fixed points at very fixed defined temperatures for us to be able to get um, a, a good scale that we can measure. They need to be defined on something. We can't just simply say, oh, that's how they just figured it out, to split zero to 100 degrees Celsius into 100 increments, and that's what it was. What they actually do do, um, Celsius uses the freezing and boiling point of water at a specific uh, atmospheric pressure. Um, now, you know that the freezing point is zero degrees Celsius. And you know that the boiling point of water is 100 degrees Celsius. And it's only those two temperatures when it is at this pressure, this normal atmospheric pressure on um, sea level. Now, if you went higher up to the mountain, there is a problem with this scale because water boils at 70 degrees uh, Celsius because the atmospheric pressure changes high on a mountain, on a really high mountain. Um, so does the boiling point of water. And that means that the scale is not very precise. It's, it has two uh, fixed points that can vary a lot when the pressure is different. And that's not really that accurate. We don't really like that scale. Um, so um, what Kelvin came up with is the absolute temperature scale. So every time you see that, it means Kelvin, the um, the scale of Kelvin. Now what it does, it uses the triple point of pure water and I will explain what this means in a second and the absolute zero. I will also explain this in a second. Um, so like I said already, temperature is how hot or cold something is but when we move on to chapter 15 we'll need to be able to distinguish between temperature and total energy of an object. So for example, an object that's got high temperature might not store very large amounts of thermal energy. Um, it actually depends on a few things. So um, temperature and thermal energy do vary a bit. Um, it depends on the number of particles. So um, a sparkler has a very high temperature, but since there's little number of particles, um, and everyone possesses high amount of energy, but there's so little of them, so it doesn't have uh, high thermal energy. Um, so it depends on the number of particles. Well, as I said, I'll mention it more again when we move on to the next chapter. And um, how much energy each particle possesses. So we will make a distinction later on. Just remember for now, um, we're just focusing on temperature, uh, about how hot or cold something is. As I said, it's a bit more, I guess, a bit more uh, complicated to distinguish between them later on. Um, now, degree Celsius, as you can see, focuses on the freezing and boiling point of water, which means at a particular pressure which actually means that it does depend on uh, properties of a particular substance. So 
So whether it's uh, at a um, point where it's changing state. So that's a property of matter, of a substance. Um, but in the absolute scale, the Kelvin scale, um, is independent of um, any physical properties. So what is triple point? Let's go back to triple point to understand why it is independent of physical properties. Now, the triple point is a very specific temperature and pressure at which a substance will exist at all three phases of matter that are in thermal equilibrium. You do need to know this as well. So that means that there will be no net energy uh, transfer between the phases. Um, and for the Kelvin scale, we actually do use the, the uh, triple point of water. Uh, which is at a temperature of 0 0.01 degrees Celsius at a, and a pressure of 0 0.61 kilopascals. Um, that's when all three uh, states of matter of water exist. So it will be liquid, uh, solid and gas at the same time with no energy transfer, no net energy transfer between those uh, three states, three phases. And um, they will coexist at the same time temperature at the same pressure. Obviously, you can see this is very different from the atmospheric pressure. So um, that's the important part of it. So that's what Kelvin uses as one point of its scale. So like we said, we need two fixed points. So one of the fixed points is that part, the triple point of water and absolute zero. Now, what we mean by absolute zero is the temperature, the lowest ever temperature possible um, is there's nothing lower than that temperature and actually we can't even reach it fully in a lab they did they have come close to it uh, in the sci the scientists but they cannot reach uh, fully absolute zero and and what does absolute zero temperature mean is that that's the temperature at which particles will have a minimum internal energy A substance will have minimum internal energy. We'll go through this more in the next lesson um, because it will have to do with internal energy, so you'll have to make the link when we come there. So, in other words, um, what the absolute temperature scale uses, instead of using zero degrees Celsius to 100 degrees Celsius and saying, okay, we're going to divide that by 100, they use zero Kelvin, which is the minimum, the absolute zero, where there's minimum internal energy uh, up to 273.16 Kelvin, which is where you have um, the triple point of water. Now, this temperature in degrees Celsius is 0 0.01 degrees. And zero Kelvin is um, minus 273.16 degrees Celsius. So that's the lowest temperature possible. Um, for simplicity in this course, we'll be using um, 273 Kelvin. And um, you should be able to convert. So I'll go back to the points. So we have seen... Um, these two now, we've talked about it. Um, so you can see that it does not depend on any property of any particular substance, as is the triple point of water, which means that all phases of matter exist at the same time. So it doesn't depend on any physical property. Um, but you should also know how to convert a degree Celsius to Kelvin. So if you have, for example, um, minus 273 degrees Celsius, you just add 273 degrees to it and to get the Kelvin and therefore you end up with zero Kelvin. It's a very easy conversion. What they did is they divided uh, the scale from zero Kelvin to 273 Kelvin uh, by 273 increments so that every time you get a change 
in degrees Celsius, it will be the same as a change in Kelvin. Um, when you write the unit Kelvin, it has to be with lower K, but when you actually write the symbol of uh, Kelvin is capital K because it's named after a person. It's actually named after um, Lord Kelvin, uh, who got uh, this um, value, well, got the scale in 1847. So now we're going to have a look at the solid, liquid and gas uh, topic which is quite simple um, and only has a few new additions from what you're used to from year seven and your GCSEs as well. Um, you know that there's three phases of matter, so solids, liquids and gases. So for example, water, which is the simplest one, uh, can exist as a solid, which is ice, liquid, which is the fluid water, and uh, gas as um, basically water vapor. Um, we will look at the spacing, ordering, and motion of the atoms or molecules that make up a substance. Uh, we'll talk about it in terms of the simple kinetic model for solids, liquids, and gases, and then we'll look at Brownian motion uh, and what that is. Um, so, to start off first, the kinetic model, what is it? It's basically telling us that all matter is made up of very small particles like uh, atoms, molecules or ions, um, which are arranged differently based on the phase of a substance. Uh, and it will also look a little bit more into, um, it will allow us, the model will allow us to explain the properties of matter and uh, the changes in phase based on the arrangement of the particles, the motion, their attractive forces between them, and also the kinetic energy of uh, the molecules that make up a substance as well. So we have a few things that when we describe the kinetic model of specific phase of matter, it's very important to mention um, a few parts that will get you most of your uh, points. Um, you should make a, a statement about the arrangement of the particles or um, atoms or molecules basically, or ions. The electrostatic forces of attraction, uh, the motion of the molecules, and a specific mention of the kinetic energy uh, as far as possible. Um, so in a solid, we have a, a structure that's arranged in a regular way. So we have a, a regular structure, a fixed structure. Um, the spacing usually between uh, uh, particles in a solid uh, is very small. So what you have is a regular structure Since there's not enough, not too much spacing between them, there's a strong um, forces of strong electrostatic forces. Of attraction. Um, the particles, um, since we're talking about the motion now of the molecules here, yeah, or particles, um, they cannot move. But they are constantly vibrating, which means it has some kinetic energy. Um, it's actually the lowest amount of kinetic energy out of all phases of matter, but it has the highest electrostatic uh, uh, force of attraction compared to all three uh, phases of matter. Then we have the liquid. Um, you know that the liquid, we're talking about the arrangement of the atoms, it has no fixed shape. You learned in your um, year seven that it takes the shape of the container that you place it in, which is usually uh, correct. Um, it still has some forces of attraction, even though they're not as strong as the solid because the liquid particles are a bit further apart from each other compared to a solid. Um, so you have some uh, electrostatic uh, forces of attraction. Um, the particles, when we talk about the motion of them, they actually are free to move and obviously hence uh, it flows. 
So that means they do have uh, more kinetic energy since they can move more. They have uh, kinetic energy more than solids, but less than gases. And we'll go to in a second. And then we talk about the phase of gas. Um, gas particles are far apart. Um, they actually spread to all the parts of the container and they don't stay uh, in a very limited volume. So if you have air particles in the room, they occupy this ho the whole room. Uh, it's just that they're very uh, they're spaced far apart. Now that means if they're further away from each other, uh, there is very little um, uh, force of for electrostatic forces of attraction. So um, almost no forces of attraction. Now here's a good point to note that um, even w w the only time they do have uh, forces of attraction is when they collide with each other and when they collide with the walls of the container. So that's an important part of uh, gases because we're going to be doing, um, we're going to be looking at ideal gases in chapter 15, which we're going to analyze more in detail. Um, they also move about they move around constantly at higher speeds than all the other states of uh, phases of matter. Um, their motion, the only special thing about this that you do need to mention is that they uh, move randomly and at different speeds to each other as well. So one particle could be going at, I don't know, 300 meters per second. The other one would be moving at 500 meters per second. Another one could be moving at 100 meters per second. It also depends on how heavy the particle is too. And obviously the kinetic energy is the highest since we have them moving fast. Remember kinetic energy relies on the mass and speed. And in this case, if they have higher speed, they have higher kinetic energy. Um, we're going to also talk about uh, density and how that is affected. But before I continue, I wanted to make a quick point again. Um, I always talk about this, but water uh, follows a different pattern when it comes to density. Um, now, we said that solid structures have the, little sp the, the least spacing between um, each particles so there's not much spacing between them whereas liquid has more spacing between the particles and gases have the least spacing between each particle. Uh, in water uh, it's it's quite unique and that's why we have uh, most of the life on earth. Um, ice so solid water um, actually has a bigger spacing so the exception here It has to do with the way that um, water, electrostatic forces in water um, behave in, in the, sorry, in the ice form, in the um, solid phase. So when water freezes, the particles actually move further apart. So water in solid uh, form has more spacing between water molecules compared to liquid. It's a very unique case. Um, I think there's a couple more substances that do that, but water is a very important one, obviously, because it's the biggest part of life. Um, you have come across density in um, about chapter four, I think. Um, so density, just a quick reminder, is mass over volume. Now in this case, uh, when we compare densities of solids, liquids and gases of normal uh, substances, um, we know that if we expect to have more uh, regular structure, that, so the spacing between solid, uh, the particles in solids is smaller, that means you have more particles in a solid structure for the same amount of volume. So if you have more uh, particles, you have more mass uh, per unit volume, hence the solid 
uh, solids are denser usually than all the other phases. And in the liquid, you have more spacing. So when you talk about density now, um, denser due to uh, smallest spacing in same volume. Um, when you talk about liquids, you have a bit more spacing between them, so you have a bit less particles, which means a lower mass uh, for the same volume, the same constant volume, which means uh, liquids are, are dense, but not as dense as uh, solids. And then you have gas, which you have a lot of spacing. So obviously, if you look at the pictures, you can, if you counted all these uh, particles uh, in the solid, in the liquid, and in the gas, uh, and you took the volume of those containers, you will see that there's less and less particles, which means that in each particle has its own mass. Obviously, even though it's tiny, it still has its own mass. Um, and you can see that there's less and less mass as you go down. So gas, the least dense as you have a uh, bigger spacing between the particles and um, that means less particles within the same volume, which means uh, gas is least dense. We said, uh, I already mentioned about water. Water doesn't follow this rule here. Um, water is uh, denser as a liquid than a solid. And that has to do with the spacing. So when it goes into a um, regular structure, um, the particles are actually further apart from each other. Um, the last part of the lesson will be about Brownian motion. Um, this, this is an effect that was noticed by Robert Brown back in 1827, uh, when he was um, using a microscope to examine particles inside um, pollen grains. And what he noticed is that uh, when they were in water, the water particles were not still, they weren't just laying there, they were moving around in um, random directions. And then later on, Albert Einstein um, explained this in a different way, which we're going to have a look at now. Uh, but Brownian motion was one of the first evidence that um, atoms or molecules of a gas or a liquid are constantly moving. So this was the first evidence of them having a kinetic energy constantly. Um, so usually we'll uh, do an experiment. Uh, well, it's mostly like an observation um, of uh, smoke uh, particles in air, uh, but um, we'll have a description of it through this uh, video. So if you look at the uh, definition here, What's brown in motion is a random movement of small visible particles suspended in a fluid. So, for example, when he first done it, it was the um, uh, pollen grains on water. So, if you imagine that this is the surface of water and these are just pollen grains. Um, and the water is the fluid, obviously. So, let's say it's a container, you're looking at it from above. Um, so what he said is that the random movement of this small visible, so gr pollen grains are quite visible to us, uh, they're suspended in fluid, so they're just floating around in the fluid, were due to collisions with much smaller randomly moving atoms or molecules in the fluid. So it might seem straightforward now, but back then it was a, a big thing. Um, so what he saw is instead of the pollen grains just remaining there, they were just constantly zigzagging moving around in different directions that were unpredictable. You wouldn't be able to think like, oh, it's going to go in that direction next, or it's going to go straight there. It wouldn't. It would just move in random directions. So what he said is that basically this motion was due to the water molecules uh, moving constantly and colliding uh, in random directions uh, at all times. So this part is quite important when we talk about uh, Brownian motion, that is the random um, movements of what's going on. So the same um, goes for smoke particles in air. 
Um, so for example, this is uh, one smoke particle in air. Um, what you will uh, experience is a motion that moves in different directions. So you also should need to show an arrow to show the direction that it's moving towards. It's always random, so if you are asked an exam question, you can make your own random little uh, diagram. And you should also be able to explain uh, why, how this motion is caused. And it's always caused by air molecules. Let's write that down. So yeah, so the haphazard haphazard uh, motion cause is caused uh, due to air molecules, which by the way themselves are randomly moving all the time in air. Um, so due to air molecules constantly striking the uh, smoke particles. Um, so also another important point point to note down is that the air molecules don't actually hit that smoke particle equally from all directions. So if we have our air molecules, which is much smaller, and we shouldn't be able to see them anyway, but when they do hit it, they don't hit it equally from all directions. Remember, we already said that gases uh, have different speeds and move randomly. So that means that it might get hit uh, by higher uh, speed in one direction than the other. So um, that leads to a net impulse gained by the smoke particle uh, from those collisions and that's why they move in that weird uh, a random way, like hap haphazard way. So this is the uh, first uh, two subchapters for the first lesson. I will add in the description below a video of the how to do the Brownian, uh, how to observe Brownian motion with uh, smoke particles and uh, also uh, for you to see the triple point of water uh, and how it visually looks like. Please do have a look at them.